Hey guys, this will be video 13 for the Flying V design build and we're going to transition into uh, building uh, a custom neck as well as uh, we're going to also uh, discuss in extreme detail uh, using uh, an, an online neck and if you uh, might have, you know, won something off of eBay that was used and how you would uh how you would attach that to your body. Again, this is very general conversation. We're going to be attaching it to a flying V, but it will attach to any, any board uh, in the same fashion, meaning any guitar body, whether it's, uh, you know, Les Paul Jr. or a SG, you name it, fill in the blank. All right, uh, uh, I have basically decided I'm going to keep this conversation just incredibly general we're just i'm just going to uh, shoot from the hip through 90 percent of this and uh i will hit about two or three different high points but primarily uh i'll start out with my reasoning uh, as to why i'm going to do a certain thing with this guitar body that we've built so far as well as how i had mentioned i'm getting ready to start another series on how to build a hollow body a flying V intended primarily for jazz and, and funk and funk and funk. Uh, the, the hollow body flying V is, a, is an incredibly articulate guitar and just has a great sound. Uh, but I'll, uh, again, I'm just going to just kind of shoot from the hip here. Uh, this, th these species of wood in the middle uh, will be, uh, very quickly, I'll move into transition, transitioning into building that custom neck out of maple and gabon ebony for the hollow body flying V. I'm not going to put that neck on our poplar body uh, sparkle flying V here. Uh, I'm going to do the uh, online neck that I bought, which was uh, really affordable. And uh, some people might be thinking, oh, man, I thought you were going to build a custom neck. Well, I am. I'm going to build a custom neck, as I just said, and we're going to put that on the hollow body fly V. Uh, why do I want to put that on the hollow body? Because my hollow body is Honduran mahogany, and it is a uh, phenomenal wood. And that, that, that maple and that gab on the ebony uh, really will, would, would, will shine once combined with the Honduran mahogany. This is Honduran mahogany right here. And from a, a standpoint of uh, uh, bell-like tones, uh, it's just a phenomenal wood. Uh, again, I'm going to try to not ramble, but be very specific. But I just want to clarify that we are, I am going to be building a custom neck, but not for this guitar. Uh, this guitar, because I'm going to um, fulfill my promise that I made about showing you guys how to buy a really affordable neck and um, and and just either bolt it on or glue it on or or build it up like you would build up a uh, or build it up identical to uh, once it's painted and ready to be installed that that if if you did paint it uh, someone would look at it and there would be no way that they could tell whether that neck was, uh, you know, built up or if it was a solid piece. And in other words, what I'm saying is um, since we're, we're crossing the threshold into really understanding how to work with epoxies and how to work with a certain grain orientation, uh, be it a quarter rift, you know, quarter rift, or plain, um, we'll, we'll be able to basically take uh, affordable wood and turn it into like master grade level. Uh, uh, well, I shouldn't use that term. That that's really needs to be <laughs> reserved for the really high quality wood species and and artist artistry. But uh, this is going to still be a gonna, going to be a phenomenal little guitar. And the more time I've spent with this neck right here, uh, I realized this is going to be a really good little neck. I think that's in the camera. Let's check our time. Make sure I'm even. Yep, we're at four minutes and 43 seconds. I'm not standing here talking to myself. So, uh, so in other words, I'm going to stick to my promise of showing you guys how to take uh, a neck. I got this for under 50 bucks, and it came out of Canada. 
And the first thing I did was did uh, a, a truss rod test, and I I put it through the through the paces. I put some mean pressure on it. I wanted to see what it was going to do. Was it going to truly uh, do a, a convey concave or convex, or was or was it going to go crazy and start twisting? And I was really impressed. It turned out really good. So it's a double adjustable rod, and uh, the more time I spent with the the, the tap tones and, and whatnot, I realized um, it's going to be a really good little knife. You can get a little bit of bird's eye right there. So, got a little bit of figure in it. Uh, this is uh, 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 the cool thing about living in the U.S. We got uh, uh, northern maple. This is a Canadian maple, which is a, a slower growth because of the real cold weather. And uh, man, the tap tones are incredible. Very, very stable wood. That's very close to plain, but it's pretty much, cons I would consider that a rift. But uh, when you look at it here and you see the, the, the grain, the annular rings, very much a plain sewn neck. What that means, that'll, that'll, it'll be a, it'll be a really nice vibrating neck. The, the tonal aspects of this neck will be stellar with the poplar. And if the poplar, some people think that the poplar is a bit of a dead wood and it's a little bit lifeless. Well, if there's anything that's going to bring it alive, it's going to be a plain sewn maple neck uh, with a um, glued in join that well, I'm not going to be doing a bolt on. It'll be glued in and not only will it be glued in, but it will be uh, fastened to the body via uh, the mortise and tenon. It'll be designed identical to the Gibson, uh, the, the tenon design. And uh, it will be epoxied in, just like I did with the Les Paul that I restored. And um, obviously, I wasn't surprised because I knew it was going to sound incredible, but it, it'll sound incredible. Um, would it sound just as good if you bolted it on? Yeah, if you get if you get these surfaces really nice and flat and m marrying up very well, you know, and and you truly know that it's not going to move around on you. Uh, and you got the four screws in there, and you really did a good job. It'll it'll be fine, um, but it'll kill the value of that guitar by about seven hundred dollars. So let's glue it in, and let's uh, let's maximize the value. So uh, again, I, I kind of shot from the hip there, but uh, let me get back on point. And um, well, there, there really is no point because I only have like two high points here on my list. Uh, and speaking of that, basically what I'm going to be covering is just a general conversation about net designs and what's available online. And then I'm going to move into talking about building uh, the, uh, the custom neck out of a three-piece maple, or either it'll be a three-piece neck. And then uh, the third point, I didn't write it down, but the third point would be I'm going to end this video probably for about 20, 20 to 30 minutes of conversation explaining to you how you can take a very, very uh, inexpensive neck and, and, and finish it. Uh, there's a lot of things that they've done in the production, the, the early production that some people would think, well, you just bolt it on and string it up and rock and roll. But there's things that you can do to really bring that neck alive. And uh, I'll be bringing up uh, working with jet glue, uh, thin jet. I call it jet glue. It's uh, CA glue. But I always call it jet glue. So if you hear me talking about jet glue, I'm talking about uh, CA glue that's either thin, medium, or thick. And I love the medium, but the, what I'm going to show you here with the thin is going to blow your mind and, and what you're able, going to be able to do to bring that old neck alive. And it will sound just as good once I get these frets uh, leveled, polished, and all that jazz. It'll feel just as good and sound just as good as, as a quality neck. So, all right, got a little bit general there, but uh, what, do I, what do I want to transition into? Um, let me just go back to uh, the beginning of this video. I explained you always start with paper. So let's start with paper, I think. Yeah, we, we can use this, and maybe I'll kind of just uh, hit two birds with one stone. Uh, I had mentioned to you, if you're really serious, go ahead and buy your maple and 
and um, I had given you some dimensions. I can't remember what width I gave you. I know I basically told you you could go, get, get away with buying a board that's three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, I rarely do that, but it's okay. You can still do that because that's exactly what the Gibson Mac is. It's a three, three piece, three quarter inch. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's three pieces that make up the neck and each piece is three quarters. I like making a three piece neck that, that the center line is around a quarter, one quarter to, to three eighths of an inch. And then, and then I, and then uh, the outside, the neck would look very much like that, except this board over here would be about one inch because my target is two and one quarters of an inch. So if you got your notebook out, that's the note, that, that's the magic number you, you really need to hit. Um, and it's, it, it really sucks because you really only need to hit it right there at the uh, body connection. Because after you go into the body connection, well, if this was the body joint right here, well, it doesn't matter anymore. Because the tenon, let me transition over here. This will be a little bit better explanation. All that matters is, is, is achieving two and one quarters of an inch width right here where you're joining the body. It doesn't matter what happens after there because obviously if you, you would be cutting all that off anyway. And again, what I'm saying, if you're, if you're working with a, uh, if you're working right at a threshold and you can only pick up two and one eighths of an inch maximum width in your board, well, I'm here to tell you it's gonna to be too narrow uh, unless you stand the fret straight up and down on the side and I'm not gonna go there. But in other words, your target needs to be a minimum of two, two and one quarters of an inch. Make sure I'm in the camera, okay? So uh, I don't mean to, to be uh, uh, redundant there, but just that's critical. You, you gotta pick up a minimum. If you wanna know the truth, you gotta pick up a minimum of two and three sixteenths of an inch. I like the two and a quarter because we're going with a Floyd Rose. Uh, I like a wider neck. It just, just if you can, let's achieve two and a quarter right there. All right, if, if, if not, two and three sixteenths will work. All right, before I start rambling, uh, and the way you do that is uh, I buy my, my billet of one inch. So once I, I'm just going to do this very quickly, but but I'm going to cover it in far more detail here in a little while. But when I set in the camera, and I know the table is kind of crazy and covered with a lot of stuff, but just just humor me here. All right. So basically, uh, oh, I'm sorry. What I'll be doing is this right here. Now my neck, my my billet is far thinner in width than yours. I think I might have told you guys you already. You need to shoot for a minimum of about four inches or either four and one half. But my board is three inches and uh, it still works. It's close. And you can see I'm just really cutting it close. Uh, uh, would, would I, you know, is that a problem? No, because when I'm sawing this out, I don't care what, how much I lose back here. All that's getting buried up in the body but I got to make certain that I keep the wood for the headstock. So, so you can see what I'm saying. I'll do a flyby and I'm getting, so, so with those two pieces right there, those two, those two rough out that, that layout in preparation for the rough, rough out will yield, uh, you know, the, the two pieces, the two, the, the base, the base, the base wing and the treble wing. And uh, I started to cut it out first, but I thought, no, I need to show on paper how I, you know, with, with the paper templates, how I would rough it out. And then uh, whatever I put in the middle, whether it's rosewood or, I, I wouldn't put ebony, you're not gonna do that. But typically what you're gonna put as a, a, a center um, piece is gonna be like a, a rosewood. And uh, rosewood is, is a beautiful wood. It's very stable. And that's probably what's going to, that's why this is on the table. That's a, a Bolivian rosewood. And for uh, an acoustic or classical guitar set, and I'll have some uh, drop when I, I'll, I'll lay out the body 
and then I'll go ahead and cut out what I need to act as my center line. And uh, so you will have your, your center line, and then you'll have your other piece over here. So if you got one inch here and one inch here, well, man, all I really need is 3 sixteenths of an inch minimum. But if I got a quarter, all the better. And I'm exactly one quarter of an inch over there. So I'll, what I will have with, with the custom guitar neck that I will be building, it will be a uh, three-piece um, hard maple neck that will have a center line of Bolivian rosewood. And if it were a little bit thin, if the Bolivian rosewood were a little bit thin, you can uh, take your some of your maple veneer that you can pick up at a woodcraft or woodcraft equivalent, and then you can glue up the maple veneer. And if you are working with a, just, just kind of let your imagination go, let's say that rather, if this was not maple, but let's say this was Honduran mahogany, okay? You could do a Honduran mahogany, base a leg and then you have the maple veneer and then the Bolivian rosewood or cocobola is beautiful as a center line and then you have the maple so you, so in other words the center line would be a three piece it would be maple Bolivian or cocobola and then it would be maple and and it, and what's really incredible is when you glue the the uh, hundred mahogany up against that that center line is absolutely stunning. And what I'm talking about, we're, we're moving into the, into the arena of doing extremely high-end uh, visual uh, guitar construction. Uh, well, because we're getting ready to build a custom neck. We won't be doing it on this little guitar because it's a popular body and it's the, they're, they're not gonna marry up very well from a valuation standpoint. So uh, that's why I'm bringing this up. And, and a lot of the reason why I'm just going ahead and talking about this custom neck is because I want to get it the hell off the table so that we can start talking about the flying V that we're actually building. But I just want you to let your imagination go there a little bit and realize, oh, wow, man, I can, I can, I can buy that piece of mahogany that I found that's one inch thick, and I've got some Bolivian, you know, you see what I'm saying? And then you could glue up that center line. It doesn't, you don't need much because see, this is the rough out. That That's the only footprint that you would need of, of the of the Bolivian or the Coca-Cola. Um, I don't know of any, I don't know if I'd recommend a, a, like a black walnut. I've never used that or a cherry. I, I just, I don't really trust cherry because I've never seen a cherry tree that was real straight and, and clean, uh, but walnut would probably be acceptable, but I've never worked with that, so proceed with caution. It would be beautiful, though, like a, a, wal a, a walnut center line with the maple, uh, a little pin stripe on either side, and then the uh, uh, and mahogany base and treble wing, or... Uh, or if you were doing a maple base and treble wing, and then you could do like a mahogany veneer, okay? So in other words, you're going light, dark, light, dark, et cetera, et cetera. Or you could go uh, maple, uh, mahogany, and then your center line could be uh, cocobola, you know, rosewood, whatever, then go back to the mahogany veneer, and then go back to the maple. And when I'm saying, the only reason I'm saying that is because, well, if you do the maple veneer, it just gets lost with the, with the other piece of maple. And, and yeah, you've got a five-piece neck, but it looks like it's a three-piece because the maple got lost with the outer piece. In other words, you're just doing contrast. But proceed with extreme caution. I had mentioned it in one of my very far past videos of uh, Try not to let your center line uh, ever go over. Uh, I would really, uh, I would really so try to get you to keep your, if you're doing a visual neck, don't let your center line get any wider than five sixteenths of an inch. That's dangerous. Once you go over a five sixteenths, if you go up to like three eighths of an inch, it starts getting really goofy looking up, up close to the fretboard. I mean the, the nut. If you're doing a classical neck, a real wide nut neck, it's not that bad. But uh, try, let's try to keep the uh, 
uh, center line of a visual neck, very thin, which which is why I'm bringing up this whole one inch thick. Uh, if, if all you've got is three quarters of an inch thick wood out here, uh, plan on doing only one pin stripe. If you were going maple, if you had a three piece maple, just like you had a three quarter and a three quarter and a three quarter. And if you wanted to do some accent uh, pin striping between that, then then yeah, that's cool. You, you, you can do that and it's tasteful. It actually does look really good. But, but if you're doing a maple, uh, make certain that your uh, pin stripe is either uh, a walnut, which would be very dark, very black, or is a mahogany. And, and then once you glue that up, it would, have to, it would have to be very, very straight, very clean, and very precise. But I, I'll, I probably spent more time talking about that than I really should have. But I just want to kind of give you guys, a, not a teaser, but just a little bit of, of a of a taste of what's to come because when i start building this neck for the hunter and mahogany flying v the hollow body flying v uh it's it's going to be that's going to be a visual neck that neck will be staying great well the whole guitar will be and uh it'll be pretty incredible but uh so on that note that's why because i had mentioned i'm going to be putting the gap on ebony on this guitar blah 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 i'm not change it here so on that note i'm going to get this custom stuff off the table and uh, i will show this just briefly i already showed um uh, the rosewood there but that neck that i'll be building uh, this this is that set i already mentioned that i could use this but this is called pa palo ferro and uh it's a bolivian rosewood it's really beautiful it's insanely and so that should be in the camera insanely straight i've had this for about five years maybe six years um i lived in south florida on a boat for a long time and i used to keep this on my boat and keep in mind we, we never I, we never ran the air conditioner the boat was always open and uh this this wood was was in a saltwater climate leaning up against the the wall in the front part of the boat uh and and that did not warp so if that tells you anything about uh, wood, and, uh, anyway, let me get this stuff off the table and uh, we're going to transition into talking about this little neck here. No, I'm sorry. I forgot something. I I'm going to talk about layout. I'm going to talk about layout on this piece right here and then we'll transition into that right here. And I'm going to check the time while I'm leaning back. Not too bad. We're at 22 minutes, give or take. All right, what are we? What have we got in front of us? Okay, so if you if you were gonna if you're gonna build your neck, um, that's just where I made that note about this is gonna be the hundred and mile flying V. So if you're going to be uh, laying out a neck custom, I'm only gonna spend about five or ten minutes with this. Uh, you will have, by now have already made the decision. All right, let me see if I can just go back to back to the very very beginning for the starting line. All right. So you made a conscious decision to build a neck at a certain scale, and that's your guitar. And if you uh, were going to stay traditional Gibson, especially, uh, this is pretty important. I'm going to shoot from the hip here. If you go traditional Gibson on everything, if you, in other words, if you move your bridge one inch further, closer to the uh, end, please go with the, the shortest scale possible to uh, to control as much of the headstock dive as possible. Because just by getting that, that neck, okay, in other words, if you went with a traditional bridge location and then you went with a 25 and a half inch scale, guess what you did? You moved your headstock two inches further out. And I, if there's anything I'll guarantee you, that son of a, you know what, it's going to dive, dive to the dive to the stage. It's going to be a nightmare. So make sure you go with the shortest scale possible on that guitar. All right, so, so let's let's say you, you're going to go my route, and you're going to do uh, either a 25 and a half inch scale or 25 inch scale or a 24 and three quarter or a 24.562. That, I'm not going to say it's irrelevant, but it's it's personal choice but the thing about that is 
by you choosing your scale, uh, we're, we're, we're going to have a certain location. I guess I'll just show it on this note. We're going to have a certain location uh, where uh, the neck is going to join the body. And on my guitar, that location is going to be the 18th fret. Now, I'm going to do that whether it's a 25 and a half inch scale or a 24.562. But what's going to happen once you make this decision and whatever you decide to pitch this, the distance from this point up to the nut is going to be determinant upon what scale you elect to go with. So if you elected to go with a certain scale, well, your, your nut, uh, uh, First, I need this again. And I'm going to get a, there's a, a brass nut, and then I'm also going to show the Floyd Rose, which is what I'll be doing. And uh, I think this will be great. This will be a great conversation. Okay, so this is your fretboard traveling up to the headstock. Whoa, we went way too long. No, what we did is we got the headstock too short. The, the heads, there's a sweet spot that this headstock has got to start pitching. I'm talking about this pitch right here. So let's say, I'm, and I don't know that number. I didn't go on Tundra Man and, and, and assess what that number is for me. But all I do know, I'm going to be going with Floyd Rose. So I got to have a platform. If I don't have a flat, flat platform <laughs> under that, that Floyd Rose nut, well, I'm going to end up, and I don't know if that's on the camera, but I'm going to end up with this cantilevering nightmare, and and that's going to look, it's going to be, look, it's going to look horrible. But if I'm going with a traditional Gibson, and I'm, and you're not doing a Floyd Rose, then you can go a little bit closer to that point. You see where I'm going with this, and and then, but if you were planning on putting a veneer out here, well, you might have to. Uh, well, you will have to engineer for that veneer based on how thick that veneer is. And if you've been here with me since I restored the Les Paul, um, I did not even go into conversation about what I had to do to engineer that neck because the um, Vulcan fiber veneer was one eighth of an inch thick. I had to allow it to come up and become part of the platform so it looked historically correct. But uh, there's, in other words, there's a lot of engineering going on from, uh, uh, I don't even know what I did with the, uh, wow, it, it disappeared, the uh, the Gibson neck. Wow, that's bizarre. Well, it's probably with my pick, wherever that is. Anyway, uh, so from, from that point right there, you know, up to your, uh, I'm curious where that, that Gibson neck is. That's bizarre. But, um. From the uh, location where you're joining the body up to the uh, pitch of the headstock is what we're talking about, and and how and once you've engineered that, whatever that number is, you've sat down with your uh, paper and you've drawn it, and you and you know that from this point here up to that point there, you've drawn it on paper, and then you've determined what sort of pitch angle you want. And originally, you'll see that these are going to be different. Uh, okay, see how the paper is not pitched as much as the one, the wooden, um, the wooden piece. The wooden piece is the 17 degree uh, vintage Les Paul pitch, and that's what I'm going to be doing on this neck right here. It will be the vintage pitch. So that's why if you get it right on paper. Then when you lay your paper up on your piece of wood, because we're preparing to cut out this piece of maple um, and uh, build a neck. And basically what you're going to be, what you're going to be doing, your piece, if you got your pieces wider, I'm just going to let this go off the table. Um, all right. Let me show it this way. And just bear with me. Tell you what, let me do this. This is the most efficient use of a board where you're where you are roughing out 
three pieces. In other words, if you're building a three piece neck where each piece is three quarters of an inch thick, that is by far, I have searched high and low to figure a, a more efficient way to rough that out. Let's see if that's on the camera. That looks great. Uh, I hope that makes sense. But, and if, and if you were smart, you bought the board, very S4S, very clean, very much machined. If not, you're gonna spend more time and effort cleaning up a board that you might discover is, is, is gonna start warping on you, whereas you should have just bought a quality musical instrument, instrument grade board and uh, they, had, they had a really good moisture content. And, and what does your board need to be? I think that's going to be four and a half. Okay, you can get away with four. So uh, four inches is the minimum if you want to rough out uh, a neck like that. And let's see how long it needs to be. That's hilarious. There's the neck. It's a good thing it wasn't a snake. <laughs> it was turned up upside down. I couldn't see it. All right, that's that magic number is 32 and one half inch minimum. So if you if you buy a board that is three quarters of an inch thick, very true, very S4S, three quarters of an inch thick, four inches wide, 32 and a half inches long, you'll have enough board in order to have a full length headstock, which will allow for that right there. Okay. And that's traditional and it, it's, 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 it's right on the threshold. You'll be cutting You'll be cutting off about an eighth of an inch. So if you're smart, get a board that's just a little bit longer than that. I'm going to give that measurement one more time and I'm giving you exact, I'm not fudging anything. Uh, 32 and one half is your bare minimum. Uh, if you're over 32 and a half, you'll still be fine and you won't have to do any, any uh, creative work or, or you won't be worried about having to clean up any corners that got cut off and stuff like that. So uh, I think that's enough general conversation about that. And again, please understand that's insanely general conversation about uh, building a neck, a three piece neck. Uh, I'm only giving you just enough to get you uh, get you online buying the wood if you haven't already bought it. Now the question would be, do I need to uh, spend any more time talking about that? I may I may be uh, redundant here, but I'm going to just show it one more time. Uh, only in the event you're sitting there going, well, man, I can't I can't find a board that I can afford that's uh, uh, that. Let's see. Bear with me for a second while I think about this. I can't find a board that's uh, X. Yeah, here we go. So in other words, you'll have to buy two boards, okay? <laughs> or uh, I'm gonna hit this very briefly and I'm not gonna spend much time talking about this. Um, uh, there's a possibility if I had to, okay, that I can build, believe it or not, I can build the whole neck out of that piece right there because I could take that center piece and I could start doing um, I could start doing some scarf joint okay I could start doing some scarf joint work for the center piece which remember the center piece only needs to be about five sixteenths for me my center piece only needs to be one quarter of an inch I've got a one inch thick board there that's going to have a lot of material left in the middle, I could fillet that middle and turn it into a center line that has uh, probably two scarf joints and be just as good as if it were solid. And I do not want to start talking about that because that'll end up being uh, a nightmare to try to explain. Uh, but if you're a woodworker, you already know that scarf joints are just as strong and just as resonant uh, if you, um, and you don't even have to follow the 12 to 1 ratio. Uh, I'll show you a scarf joint here. This is a scarf joint. And what is that? What is that angle? Oh, that, is that, in other words, does that make sense? This board right here was cut on an angle. And then this, this board 
Uh, let's see if I can find. Where's my sanding block? Yeah, here's my sanding block. Okay, you had a single board running up here, and it got it got the end cut off on an angle. Well, guess what that angle is? That angle is exactly what that headstock pitch is, and that just magic number happens to be 15 degrees. And I've already designed a jig that will do a 17 degree headstock angle. So if I wanted to do a scarf joint, uh, and and I can assure you these are. These are just as strong as if that was a solid piece of wood. It's very frowned upon. A lot of people think it's cheap, but that's exceptional uh, woodwork right there. And it's it's industry standards in the in the, the marine industry, uh, boat building, that it's just as strong. They go to like a 12 to 1 ratio. Uh, this would not be nearly that much, but uh, it's a very strong joint. So... I hope I didn't ramble about that, and I hope I didn't go off the rails and get confusing. But in other words, scarf joints are, are fine uh, as long as you have the proper the type of glue, and you have to be able to clamp. You have to really know how to clamp that. So now I can get this off the table. I'm going to check the time. And we're at 36 minutes, so this is, this is pretty good. It's not too long. But it'll probably be close to an hour because I'm going to move into some pretty uh, detailed conversation about that neck now. Um, and I don't think there's any reason to keep this on the, on the table. But if I need it, it's, all, it's just right across the, the way there. I don't think I'll need this. I'll leave the nut and the, uh, the Floyd Rose nut and the brass nut up on the table just in case. We need access to it. Otherwise, I don't think I need that. Uh, okay, um, I don't think I'll need the Gibbs, I mean the Gretsch. Well, I can show you that. that that's a good idea of what I'm talking about. This would be considered a three-piece neck. This is a 1960s Gretsch. Uh, I think this is either 61, 1961 or 62. This is my hollow body. It was, this was a double anniversary. And where I'm going with this, this would have been this, roughly the same neck that they had on the 59 or 60. And uh, two-piece neck, massive, you know, massive single piece of maple there, single piece there. And then they ran a piece of, uh, I think that might be, it might be a, a, a walnut. I'm pretty sure it's walnut right down the middle. And it's a shame because this whole guitar got really took a beating. Somebody just pretty much destroyed it when they took the frets out. This is Brazilian rosewood. But uh, I won't start talking about that, but I just want you to see it. That would be, some people would consider that, that a three-piece neck. I don't I don't view that. I, I view that as a two-piece neck, even though it's got the accent line down the middle. middle. That, that center line lends no structural integrity. To that neck it's just acting as a platform by which the glue uh, is connects and it, and it probably was more so if anything just to spread that neck apart why because these necks are incredibly thin for just barely over two and one eighth of an inch and had they have not put that center line in there they would not have they would they would not have they pro they would not with those that board they would not have met their target minimum width at the body join. So, all right, next, next, next. What's what what is, what is next for the neck? Uh, I don't want to start talking about Bolivian rosewood. There's no sense in talking about that. Uh, I I'll, I'll hit this briefly just again just to make certain that you just kind of have the broad strokes view. What this is, uh, this is the, the template that I, I built uh, when I was uh, built restoring the uh, 75 to 82 uh, Gibson Les Paul Custom. And that for, that heel hit right there. That's the exact pitch. And it's a, it's, it's a sweet design. I put 17 degrees on it, but I kept this because I, I realized this is awesome because I've already got my... Uh, nut location, my 17 degrees. If I want to use this to build um, uh, a flying V, in other words, uh, that ought to make perfect sense that all I did was I just transferred that shape right there. I just transferred it down 
and then this is the location. I, and again, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being condescending. It's just that I, I know that there's somebody out there that is is very new to this stuff. And uh, I've been doing this a long time, and I know a lot of guys watching it probably have as well. But basically, all I did was was move that down to right there. Okay, sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words, and that's what that's what that line represents right there. So, do I want to cut this out? Hell no, man, because I, want, I may build another Les Paul. Uh, if I'm building a flying V, all I got to do is lay this on the board. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to make the noise, but or make so much noise and do my tracing up there or, or do my tracing up there and then simply move the neck down about three inches and finish out the trace. Okay. That should make perfect sense. And then, uh, cause this is just a flat surface. It doesn't matter how far that goes. Well, you know, within reason, but what's critical is that point right there, that point right there in relation to that point, which just happens to go up to that point. And if we're building, if we're building a Les Paul, then 18th, 17th, 16th, is that right? Uh, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th. If we're building a Les Paul, okay, there's our Les Paul or our Gretsch, uh, a silver jet, dual jet. And guess what happens when we want to build a flying V and we take it to the 18th. You just see what I did? I went from the 16th to the 18th. That's all I did. And then we would cut this off. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the SG and the Gibson 335, I think they might be at the 19th fret. Uh, the SG may be at the 20th. I'm not really certain. But if you see my point, that's what I'm talking about. By If you build yourself this little jig right here based on your paper drawing, then you simply lay this down and just trace around it. And you don't even have to think anymore because you've already done all your engineering based on uh, basically three or four critical points. The, the, the fret location by which you've decided to join your body, your neck to your body. And this, the pitch angle, whether it's one degree, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, uh, this happens to be four and a half degrees for a Les Paul-esque type guitar, small bodied arch top. And then once you get up to this location, the other critical point is how much pitch you start putting on it. And then obviously, if you're going to go with a certain headstock, well, you got to have uh, the face to receive that again I'm, I know I'm speaking in very general terms here but um, it's just this is the neck construction there's a lot of real general stuff to be considered and how do you go about engineering these things uh, you as I mentioned you visit a fretboard calculator site like tundraman.com uh, t-u-n-d-r-a-m-m-a-n I believe tundra tundra man yeah yeah, Tundra, like the, um, is it a Toyota, Toyota Tundra? Apparently he's into t Toyotas, or maybe he's into Tundra snowing, or I don't know. So anyway, long story short, go on tundraman.com. He's got a fretboard scale calculator. It just, it's very, it's very, very easy to understand. You just type in the scale and, and hit calculate, and it just gives you all this incredible information about the distance from the, the beginning of the fretboard. I want to keep talking about this because I like. I want to just keep this very general. Uh, when you're on this fretboard scale calculator, and let's say you've decided you're going to go with a Floyd Rose, okay? All right. So whatever the whatever the width. Well, okay, well, let's let's just measure. The Floyd Rose nut. You need to allow at least about nine sixteenths of an inch, and. The metric on that is going to be, it's almost, it's not 16, um, but roughly 15, 15 millimeter, uh, whereas the basic nut, I think it'll be about six. No, it's not, it's not even five. So five millimeter versus, uh, we're, we're talking about engineering. It's very critical. And I, this may sound like I'm going off the rails, but if you're really, thinking about this stuff, you're, you, you know what you're, you know what I'm talking about. All right. So in other words, you went on Tundra man and you found that from the beginning of the fretboard 
and to the 18th fret, which is where I decided to connect my body to my guitar. I mean, excuse me, my, my neck to my guitar body. And that's what I meant by eventually I'm going to be coming in here with my miter saw and I'm going to be cutting off about an inch or an inch and a quarter or an inch and a half. But the last thing I want to do is just guess at that. That's a very much engineered number, a, a distance from this point to that point. Critical beyond critical uh, and even if the scale variation might be a quarter of an inch uh, you you miss that target game over you'll, you'll be doing something so we know that number and we we know what we're going to put on what type of nut we're going to be using we're using a uh, uh, Floyd Rose which is roughly a half inch I'm just going to grab that number out of the air and then so what did that do that pushed our uh, starting line measurement location down a half inch from this point. And now if Tundra Man's calculator tells us that the 18th fret is at a certain distance, well then all we got to do is measure up here and make that mark. And then we set our pitch. Okay. It's as simple as that. And, and I, and I, if anything, I'm probably making it, seem more complex than it really is but when you're looking at a blank sheet of paper I, I like to refer back to that it's one thing when you're sitting here looking at a neck and think well that's not that complex it's not that big of a deal well yeah I mean because somebody engineered it you know a long time ago and and all these all these are in our hands is just um, the continuation of someone sitting at a table and for the most part uh, uh, no, Gretsch was doing 25 and a half inch scales away before Leo Fender, and I'm pretty sure Gibson was as well. So, whomever designed the 25 and a half inch scale, they've already engineered all this stuff out. But if you're, you know, back to this, if you're going with the Floyd Rose, it'll it'll be pushing your fretboard down, or in other words, it'll be uh, changing your starting location. If you're going with a a, a bone nut. The bone nut. The bone nut is basically the same as the brass, which is very, they're very thin. I, I want to say, I'm not going to guess. Just it's it's a little bit over a quarter, I believe. But just go online and check it out. I'm not sure what the metric would be. But all I'm saying is, uh, we're engineering. Uh, we're having to do a lot of engineering based on uh, final call decisions that we've made. That, that we now realize how critical they are because if we're, if we're thinking that, um, ah, you know, maybe I'll change my mind and put a Floyd Rose nut on there. Uh, well, then that's what you're going to end up with. And, and it'll be, it'll prove that you didn't engineer your neck. Okay. So that ought to make sense. And I'll stop talking about that because if anything, that's probably uh, almost in, up to the point where it would be annoying. All right, let me think. Uh, let me pause the video for a second. I'm going to clean the table up a little bit and get and regroup and look at my notes and consider what I have not discussed and how I can transition into talking about the, the neck that I'm going to be putting on this guitar. Okay, I'll finish uh, talking about some of the, the layout and engineering of the fretboard in relation to the guitar body. Um, what I really didn't transition into was I only talked about making the calculations up to the point where you're connecting the neck to the body. But what I, I failed to go into, let me see if I, this is in the camera. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm just going to hold it down here and you can zoom in if you need to. I would really recommend uh, doing something like this uh, where you you've decided on a certain design just literally uh, draw it out full scale based on the numbers that you get uh, that you get online from your fretboard calculator and what your the, the primary numbers that you're going to want to really uh, well you're going to want to know every one of them but the most important starting point will be what is the distance from the nut and when I say the nut I mean the beginning of the fretboard Okay. In other words, the, 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 this edge of the nut or the beginning of the fretboard. So in other words, the distance from the beginning of the fretboard to the center of the bridge. And on this 
um, 59 replica, it ended up being 24.562. And uh, if you decide to go with a, a 25 inch scale guitar, well, then that number will be roughly 25 inches. And if you go with a 25 and a half inch scale guitar, well, then that number should be 25 and a half inches. But once you choose that scale, whichever scale you elect to go with, all of these other numbers and, and points uh, change ever so slightly. Not much, but they do change enough that if you put your body on the drill press and you put the uh, brid bridge studs in a certain location, um, you could be far enough off that you cannot get the guitar to intonate. And if you, if you uh, made the mistake of going ahead and routing for the bridge pickup, and then you realize, oh my gosh, I got my, my bridge too far away. Now you're having to move the bridge closer to your bridge pickup and every, you're, you're losing everything. So it's critical that you do this engineering on paper. The nut or the beginning of the fretboard to the bridge is most important. And then you'll want to determine where you're going to connect that neck to the body. And mine is going to be the 18th. On this drawing, it's the 20th. So don't let that throw you. But uh, uh, so let's go to this drawing and let's say um, we're going to join our body at the 20th fret. Well, when you do your drawing, make sure you do the dash lines for your heel to show that, okay, well, that's my flying V. There's the little uh, schedule 40, one and a half inch coupler corner. And there's the heel and the, you know, in other words, that was about a two and a quarter inch uh, diameter one and one eighth inch radius corner and then we can start determining where we're going to put the pickups or how it looks visually we've already talked about a lot of this stuff in extreme detail but every bit of this relates to the neck that they, they they work in tandem and unless you've um, done it on paper uh, unless you have successfully mapped it out on paper odds are you're not going to be able to successfully map it out uh, on, on the, the work table. Uh, the next choice would be decisions, decisions about the headstock and what do you do? Uh, what do you, you know, what do you do? And uh, I've tried pretty much everything and um, even though I, I don't like uh, that design, this is not Gibson. It's nowhere near it. Gibson is much wider at this point right here but even my my actual finish is even smaller than that it's very very petite it look it almost looks chintzy on paper but this headstock is just beautiful it's beautiful on the guitar and that's what i'm going to be putting on here when i ordered this little neck let me make sure 5305 yeah i was sitting there thinking i thought wait i want to make sure i restarted the camera so uh, uh, when I bought this neck online, I thought, man, it'd be awesome if I get lucky and those uh, tuner locations just happen to fall right right in line with, with where I need them. They didn't fall any, anywhere near it. I mean, it's so far off. I'll pull this up in a little while and show you. They're so far off. They're so far off, it's good. It's actually very good because it will assure that once I re-engineer this headstock that it'll be fine. Didn't matter if, if they hit, one or two of them hit real close and that's fine, but we'll discuss that in a little while. But uh, I'm gonna be going with a kind of a traditional headstock. Uh, I tried so hard to make this work because I really wanted to do something unique. Let me see if that's in the camera. Uh, might be too far away. Uh, so I wanted to do something like that right there. Well, actually, it would be about that. Let me see if that's in the camera. I don't know. It's hard to tell. But uh, but what I did, I took the body and I, I clamped I clamped the neck on it at my 18th fret, as we already know. And I, I stood it up on the table and just stepped back and looked at it and asked myself, what do I see? And truth be known, that looks really good. I mean, it, it was funny. I was sitting there almost for just a split second thinking, what the heck, man? Just do it. But then I realized, no, that's not traditional. I don't, I don't want to do that. And then um, 
I taped this up on the on and, it, and let me do it. Let me say this. I put this up first. Let me see if that's in the camera. I would be off if I dropped the body off the side of the table. Let's see if that's in the camera. Close enough. So I put this on first, and what did I see? Uh, uh, I knew exactly what I saw. I mean, it looked as close to traditional as you can get. And me being the designer, I couldn't help but start toying with um, different ideas. Um, I've, I've tried this before. Uh, Albert King, I think. I think uh, Dan Erlewine built one for Albert King. It doesn't look good. It just, it's wrong. It's just, it's, a, it's like putting a pickup truck bed on a Corvette. It just didn't work, even though they're both Chevrolet. Uh, and then I tried the whole, uh, and this one is actually cut down a little bit, uh, smaller than, than the, uh, the Kramer, the, the bigger style. This one's cut down a little bit. It looks great. I mean, it's, it's really, really balanced, very nice. I mean, it's it immediately, as soon as I put it on the guitar, it just, it didn't work. So... It does look good, and I think there's a guitar player that's pretty famous that's, that plays this guitar. Uh, if you like that, go for it. It's a little bit longer than it needs to be. The guitar is already a long guitar, but I'm going to stay traditional, and I'm going to go with this uh, weird-looking little, uh, little angle. But one thing that I did do, let's see if this will show up on the camera. And I'm not going to start talking because I know my voice gets really loud when I'm behind the camera. But, but one thing that is critical, I'll try to just lower my voice. One thing that is critically important to me is the, the, the pitch by which that the strings come off the nut. And I know on the traditional guitar, the vintage guitar, Man, that string is on an insane angle coming off of the nut, and so is the high E. And then even the, um, the would that be the A and the, the B? Is that it? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, but anyway, the, these, these four strings right here, these four tuner locations right here on the traditional guitar, man, they're flared out so far, it's insane. And for certain, you're not going to be running a Bigsby on that thing. But um, I, I brought everything in. And again, this is not even the one I'm going with. The one I'll be going with is this right here, which it's brought in uh, uh, a little bit more. And then I just made certain that these string locations fell in a real comfortable path. And then I kept this traditional, the distances from here to here. I don't want to give that information out because mine are not Gibson. I know that. Mine are actually Gretsch. <laughs> you want to know the truth? Just... If, that's the same distance on a on a grip on my sixty one twenty, the a double anniversary or the conversion, it's that same distance. And I brought them in, I tapered it in. But uh, let's let's change gears and let me look at the time again. I want to keep this under an hour if I can. We're at fifty eight minutes. Uh, I'm just going to knock out some some high points here, and then we'll cover some extreme detail later on. Uh, I'm going to be going on the oscillating sander and burning. Okay, I'll show you what I had to do. Let me look in the camera and see if it shows up. Hopefully it'll silhouette through. This is parchment paper for like baking cookies. It's incredible for doing tracing paper. But you can see the original tuner locations right there and right there. And, and I'm, I'm pretty close. I've only got to add a little bit of wood, but I'm going to be um, taking an oscillating sander burning off a uh, cutting a traditional curvature right there traditional curvature on the other side and then i'm going to be putting this on the table saw and cutting some real clean straight lines and uh, i'll be doing this type of stuff right here hope i'll keep dropping the net so i got these pieces right here this is left over from building the um, neck for the gibson les paul custom this would have been the, probably, yeah, something like that. That would have been that location right there. So 
don't don't ever throw your scraps away because you never know you might be building a, a flying V headstock out of it. Oh, I almost dropped. I can get behind the camera. Basically, I'll be doing that right there. I'll be I'll be gluing on these. These are called ears. When you glue additional wood on the side of a headstock that you've built up, that's just called ears. And I'll be basically building it up. And then I'll be doing a veneer work across the top, a veneer work across the back. All that will be done with epoxy. I'm going to have uh, maple dowels that I've custom cut that I'll be epoxy gluing in. I'll be fitting them. I don't like to do round dowels. I like to do split dowels. That way I can put them in wicked strong. I mean, they're just stiff. I can basically hammer them in almost like a, a tenon join. And then once they're epoxied in, they are as strong as the original. I hope that was on the camera. But so basically I'll be uh, filling in the original tuner locations with uh, bird's eye maple from the Les Paul. And I will be putting the ears on here and then on that side. And then I'll have a veneer on either side. All that will get feathered, sanded, shaped, cleaned up real nicely and primed and painted. And, uh, and you'll never know. Well, you will know because there'll be the video series showing how I did it. And uh, then that will get installed in this guitar. And we'll have a finished guitar just like that. Um, one thing, uh, let me look at the time. I don't want to go too far over an hour if I am over an hour. I'm, I'm one minute over an hour. I'm going to go just, just a little bit, a little bit longer. Um, one thing I'm going to be discussing is how to take, um, the CA glue and how to glue, glue your frets in and how not to get, uh, uh, CA glue all in the wood. What you do is you wax the wood first and then you, then you come in and you, you pour. I'm going to, I'm going to show all this in future videos, but I'm just letting you know, uh, just listen to this tap tone. Real bright, real snappy. Okay, that's what it should sound like up here. I want you to listen to this. Sounds pretty similar, right? Now what that tells me is uh, I have already repaired this fret location with the CA glue. In other words, I glued this fret in. And I didn't make a damn mess of the fretboard because I waxed it first with a saddle soap, or this stuff is called Renaissance. Just research it. It's really incredible. Um, I waxed it to keep the uh, CA glue from getting on the surface, and then uh, I took the CA glue and I just let gravity work to my advantage, and I glued that fret in. Now listen to the difference. This is the good fret. Listen to the dead ones. I'm sorry, that's the good one. Hear how dead it is? It's not trick camera work, I'm just... No, they got lucky on that one. That almost got a little bit better right there. Hear, hear how dead their fret work is? That's why it's a $50 neck. But just by me coming in here with my knowledge, I'm going to be able to uh, CA glue every one of these frets and every one of these frets are going to sound like a $5,000 jazz guitar. This, this guitar is going to sound incredible. We got uh, Canadian maple. We got, this is an engineered um, ebony. I'll talk about that later. It's, it's very nice. It's not real. It is real wood, but it's engineered. And uh, it sounds good. It's got a great tone, tap tone. When you get to it, it's real warm and sweet. But once we get these frets cleaned up, that's going to be incredible. Uh, I'm going to be coming in here and drilling out these, possibly drilling out these Mother of Pearl locations, putting a little bit bigger a dot in there, maybe, may not. And then I just mentioned how we're going to be using uh, saddle soap and jet glue or a crystalline, uh, uh, micro crystalline wax polish. And what that will do, uh, that will keep our fretboard protected while we're doing the, while we're finishing this neck. They, they, you would think that, well, just bolt it on, it's finished, but it's not. By our knowledge that, that you're going to have after I show you how we do this, you're going to be able to take a $50 neck and make it sound incredible. 
and then we're going to do all this uh, butcher work up here, <laughs> rebuild the headstock. And I've already talked about the scarf joints. And I'm going to stop, and, uh, and I'm probably just going to shut the video down, and uh, I'll leave something there in the in the camera <clears throat> or in the video, the view. Because I like to leave a clean, tidy station after I'm through for the day. I wasn't planning on doing a video tonight, but I realize uh, I'm beginning to get a lot of people uh, showing some interest in these videos. And I had mentioned that um, I want to stay active on YouTube. And um, I'm, I'm in the school of thought. If you're going to do something like this, uh, you know, you know, keep, keep, them, keep them coming. Keep, keep, keep the videos going. There's nothing worse than finding a site that you like. And then they only do one video a week or either one video every week or two. And you're, and it's not that you get attached to them, but you're kind of, you're interested, you know, you're, if you, and if you guys are going to devote your time, man, I want to devote my time too. And, um, uh, again, I'm, it's very humbling to know that there's people all across the world, even, uh, watching some of my videos. <clears throat> and if there's anything I can do to, you know, make a difference in the guitar world, then that's cool. And so be it. Uh, again, I'm very happy with the guitar body. It's turned out really well. And uh, we might discuss that a little bit more, but for the most part, the, the body's behind us. And uh, she's ready She's ready to be uh, to receive the neck. And I probably will only be showing you how to build this neck up so that we turn it into like a traditional mortise tenon neck and fit that in there. But as I'm doing that, I'll show you if you were just going to bolt this neck in, well, then all you do is this, this, and this, and you won't have to do all that stuff. So we'll cover that stuff later on. Again, thanks for staying in the ring. And uh, from here on out, I will try to keep the videos around 45 minutes at the, at the max. All right. Thanks, guys.